Thank you, everyone who's joined us um, this evening for the launch of Professor Susan Carruthers' um, new book, uh, Dear John, Love and Loyalty in, in Wartime uh, America. Uh, my name is Dr. Mark Condos. I'm the, uh, one of the co-directors of the Sir Michael Howard Center for the History of War here at uh, King's. Uh, and so I'm just going to introduce um, the speakers we have for this evening. Uh, and we're going to hear some comments from them about um, this wonderful book um, that uh, Professor Carruthers has written. Um, and then we will also, after uh, there's been some discussion between the panelists, uh, open it up for questions from the audience, whether um, in person um, or online. Um, so first off, uh, it's my, my pleasure to introduce Professor, uh, Professor Susan Carruthers, um, whose book we're here to celebrate this evening. Uh, Professor Carruthers specializes in U.S. and international history with particular expertise on the role of media in war, uh, Cold War culture, and uh, colonial counterinsurgency across the 20th uh, and 21st centuries. Uh, her work has examined how individuals and societies have made sense of conflict uh, and its aftermath. And she's, aside from the book we're celebrating this evening, she's the author of numerous other books, including Winning Hearts and Minds, um, uh, The Media at War, Cold War Captives, um, and The Good Occupation. Um, so that's uh, Professor uh, Susan Carruthers. Um, following uh, uh, that, we have uh, Professor Joanna Burke, um, who's a, a professor of history um, at Birkbeck University. Professor Burke is kindly joining us um, from Greece um, this evening uh, online. Uh, professor Burke's wide-ranging work has examined topics including women's history, gender and masculinity, working class culture, the history of emotions, psychiatry and medicine, sexual violence, and histories of war. She's the author of 13 books. Um, pardon me, um, uh, Joanna, if, if it's more than that. Um, when I was looking at your copious bibliography, I found 13, um, but 13, possibly more books, uh, which include Husbandry and Housewifery, uh, Women, Economic Change, and Housework in Ireland, 1890 to 1914, Dismembering the Male, Men's Bodies, Britain, and the Great War, An Intimate History of Killing, Face-to-Face -face Killing in 20th Century Warfare, Fear, uh, Cultural History, Rape, a history from 1860 to the present, um, and loving animals on bestiality, zoophilia, and posthuman uh, love. Um, Professor Burke is also the editor of War uh, and Art. Um, following from Professor Burke, we're going to hear some comments um, from Professor uh, Greg Dadis, um, who's also joining us um, here online. Uh, Professor Dadis is the USS Midway Chair in Modern US Military History uh, and is director of the Center for War and Society at San Diego University. Uh, Professor Data specializes in Cold War history with a focus on the American War in Vietnam. Uh, he's the author of five books, including uh, Fighting in the Great Crusade, an Eighth Infantry Artillery Officer in the, uh, World War II, uh, No Sure Victory, Measuring U.S. Army Effectiveness and Progress in the Vietnam War, Westmoreland's War, Reassessing American Strategy in Vietnam, and Withdrawal, Reassessing America's Final Years in Vietnam. Uh, his most recent book, which you guys can see um, next to him there in the uh, video capture, um, is Pulp Vietnam, War and Gender in Cold War Men's Adventure Magazines, which examines how men's adventure magazines uh, helped shape the attitudes and masculine identities of American soldiers uh, during the Vietnam War. Um, and I think, as we'll see, there are a lot of interesting synergies and overlaps between um, Professor Dadis' work and Professor uh, Brothers' work that we're going to be talking about this evening. Um, we were meant to be joined this evening by uh, Professor uh, Kara Buick, who is the Lance Corporal Benjamin uh, W. Schmidt Professor of War, Conflict, and Society in 20th Century America um, at Texas Christian University. But unfortunately, um, due to uh, personal reasons, uh, Professor Buick is no longer able to join us for this evening. Um, but I'm told Professor Buick has uh, sent along some questions and some comments um, to Professor Dadis, so he will be um, relaying those um, after his um, comments and questions to Professor Carruthers. Um, and finally, not but uh, last but not least, um, we have um, Dr. Uh, Aaron Hiltner. Sorry, Hiltner. 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 Um, uh, uh, Professor Hilt. Sorry, Dr. Hiltner is a lecturer in United States history um, here at UCL. Um, Dr. Hiltner specializes in the history of the United States, and his work focuses on empire, ecology, the military foreign relations and masculinity. His first war, uh, book, uh, Taking Leave, Taking Liberties, American Troops on the World War II Home Front, was published with Chicago University Press in 2020, um, and it examines uh, civil military conflict in the US mainland during uh, the Second World War. So 
that's enough for me um, introducing our very uh, distinguished uh, uh, and bright panel. Um, so what uh, I'm going to uh, do now is I'm going to turn it uh, over to uh, Professor Burke, um, who's going to begin um, with some uh, comments and some questions on Professor Burke's work. So Professor Burke, uh, please do take it away. Hi, look, I'm really thrilled to be here. Let me just share my screen with you. Um, just bear with me for one minute. Great, look, I'm so thrilled to be here. I mean, this is an um, incredible, incredible book, and I'm gonna tell you why I think this, that that's the case. But I wanna start my talk today by giving you a little bit of nostalgia um, from my childhood in New Zealand in the 1980s. And what I wanna show you is just a one minute and less than a minute um, advert that was on New Zealand television in the 1980s. And I think it, the reason I wanna show this to you is because I think it genuflects towards some of the themes that come up in Susan's really extraordinary book. So let's just listen to this now. O'Reilly, Sir, Kowalski, Crump, and Gallagher. For my girl Shirley, we're gonna be married. Dear John, oh, how I hate to run. Dear John, Shirley. I must let you know tonight that my love for you is gone. So I'm sending you the song. Like him, he's your brother, so true to you forever, dear John. Play it again, John. So there we have it. I mean, I think this uh, this advert, which I remember from my, my childhood, is relevant for uh, to this launch for so many, many reasons. Um, only five years before this ad was broadcast, New Zealand soldiers had returned from Vietnam. Wounds were still raw. And here I'm talking about emotional wounds as well as physical ones. But BASF, the world's largest manufacturer of cassette tapes. Um, in fact, some people in this audience may not even know what cassette tapes uh, used to be, what, what they were, but they were confident enough to about their audience to know that there was also humor in Dear John Letters. Note the gruff, world-weary sergeant with his cigar. Um, crucially, I think, the ad actually starts with him, not the dear John, because letters are important. Letters, cassettes, communication between the home front and the war front are important. And the sergeant acts as this kind of master of ceremonies, handing out the letters and the cassettes from back home, or what you know, Sus, uh, Susan calls mail with magical properties, letters as sacralized objects. Only then in this ad does the, does, does the camera turn to the naive young man, I mean, uh, practically a boy, not really up to the task of being a warrior, perhaps trying to prove his manly vigor to his lover by enlisting. But of course, being gazumped by, of all people, his own brother, who of course was not doing his bit for the nation. Then there is that deceptively upbeat song of the female lover confessing to infidelity. The soldiers, you'll notice, fellow comrades in arms alternate between these rather knowing smiles and sympathy for their dumped co comrade. As they listen to the tape, knowing um, what must be coming, um, they reveal, I think, this kind of raw vulnerability and dependency on women. Some of them, including the gruff sergeant, almost tear up 
thinking that um, it could have been a Dear John letter to them. In Susan's words, the only bond that men in uniform can truly trust are those between male comrades in arms. So in other words, we've got here this theme, which is a really big one um, in Susan's book of brotherly bonds. Dear John, and here I'm talking about the book, um, is I think a really masterful history of a concept that was only coined during the, during the Second World War due to some really quite unique features of that war, including the global mobilization of young men, a significant proportion of whom were married. But, you know, of course, the theme of women deserting their men in times of war goes back to ancient times. But as Susan really lovelily unpicks, that it's the meaning that has changed. Susan points to the vast number of reasons for these shifts in meaning, including things like um, ambivalence about whether married men should be in the military in the first place, um, anxieties about prost not prostitutes, about patrotutes um, and so-called allotment ands, miscegenation and marriage to foreigners, not to mention uh, what she doesn't mention in the book is the kind of scandal here in Britain, at least, that um, uh, the discovery that French women didn't wear knickers to bed. Um, technology is a really big theme here, as we saw in the clip of the ad, cassette tapes, as well as the more traditional pen on paper letters were really, really important. So these technological shifts are something that Susan really has a really fantastic uh, large section about. In fact, it's one of the parts of the book that I found most fascinating because Susan tells us that by, I think it's 1971, something like 90% of service personnel re relied on cassette tapes to communicate with uh, people back home. And of course, the other important theme of the book in terms of understanding changing meanings is the rise of military psychiatry, which led to the um, medicalization of broken heartedness. Now, Susan, I think what, what's really one of the things really incredible is that she's done this amazing job in digging out a, a wide range of actually really very, very elusive um, sources, um, including letters, official documents, chaplaincy records, psychiatry reports, films, novels, oral histories, women's magazines, and so on and so on. So she builds up this multi-layered story here. And of course, these sources are, are finding Dear John letters and these sources are very difficult. After all, um, lovers tore up Dear John letters into small pieces and scattered them around. They ceremoniously burnt them or used them. And this is a term that I, I've discovered through Susan, thank you, as bummeth. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it. Anyway, bum fodder, basically. Um, Post-war commemorations also preferred to ignore the fact mm -hmm. that women folk maybe weren't as behind their men folk as um, they had kind of hoped. Um, and of course, none of us like to dwell on the fact that love doesn't conquer all. The rather sweet um, story of Anne uh, Guddis, um, uh, her correspondence with Corporal Samuel Kramer, um, including her uh, notorious one-liner, go to hell, which kind of forms a backbone to uh, Susan's book. Um, I mean, that story actually did have a happy ending, but that was um, probably rare. To be dear John was not um, pleasant. This is why the military was very concerned about dear John letters. Blue moods were contagious. Jilted men might be forgetful or reckless in battle. They might, might go AWOL, they might drink to excess, they might commit suicide. They were not in fighting shape. They might lash out 
committing atrocities against the enemy or even their own um, officers. Fragging is one theme that Susan really uh, looks at um, well. They, um, as General uh, George Patton famously quipped, um, this was why women who began letters, dear John, should be shot as traitors. Of course, it was this whole story that Susan tells and the way she tells it um, shows that this was a very one-sided kind of narrative, if you like, the double standard uh, reigned supreme male infidelity in comparison was treated with greater leniency being seen as sort of necessary to let off steam. In other words, infidelity she shows was highly situational girlfriends were taught that it was their duty to be faithful. Wives were expected to wait often years for their POW husbands to come home. And if they strayed, I think the word is very interesting in itself, they were um, vilified. Female emotional labor required really very, very heavy lifting. Now, um, we were asked um, at the end of our reflections on um, the book to, I think, questions we wanted to, to ask Susan. And there are so many things, in fact, that I wanted to ask her after I, I read this book, not because, I, have, I hasten to say, not because she's omitted important topics or has not been clear. In fact, I think this book is an excellent example of clarity combined with depth, but precisely because her arguments um, are so rich. In other words, the book throws up all these really big questions about love, about marriage, about war more broadly. So some of the things that I would be really curious about is, I think I wanted to know more about the women involved, the women themselves. I mean, one thing Susan shows very, very clearly is that the blame was placed on the jilters. But I'd be really interested kind of to know whether they actually felt guilty or ashamed and, to, and how they coped with, with this. Um, I also thought sections on the section on psychiatry um, conflated a lot of different professional groups. Um, so in other words, we've got civilian psychiatrists versus militarily socialized ones. We've got psychoanalysts versus social workers. We've got chaplains and so on and so on. And I'd really, would like to hear more from her about the differences between these groups. And finally, I think more could have been said about the relationship between um, breaking up in civilian contexts um, and a comparison being made to those war contexts. I mean, I'm sure we all here know people today who have, or the last uh, few years, who've been dumped by SMM um, and or by you know, changing status on, um, on Facebook pages. Susan really has a, does a wonderful job in speculating about how these changes, again, in technology um, might have had an impact. But I think this is where um, oral history with serving military personnel might have been really um, particularly insightful. But you know, but these are these are quibbles. These are to ask for um, just uh, her to write four or five books on this wonderful, wonderful topic. I mean, um, her concluding words, um, I think, were really, really powerful. I mean, just how she how she concludes this book, and she says very simply, um, she writes, "The dear John letter has helped make women, not war, the culprit for love's breakdown under pressure." It's time for other stories and other voices to be heard. And I think that's a really powerful way to really conclude what is an extraordinarily um, historical, literary, um, and exciting book. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Thank you so much for that, um, uh, Joanna. Um, so uh, uh, we'll hear from uh, Professor Davis now with uh, his thoughts and reflections. Great, thank you. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, and Susan, congratulations on just a, a fabulous book. I'm, I'm so excited to be talking about this, especially with both you and, 
and Joanna, whose work I, I admire greatly. Um, I want to apologize to everybody. Um, first up, the uh, the San Diego Gas and Electric Company is doing their best to recreate a, a World War I trench battlefield uh, in the street just below me uh, next to our house. So if there's a little, little bit of background noise, I apologize. So um, Joanna hit on so many important points, and, and uh, not surprisingly, I'll, I'll probably be repeating some of them. Um, but I think it's best for me to start with uh, an admission that, that I read this book as, as one of multiple stories that were, were unfolding simultaneously. And, and each one as the book was going on was building on each other in, in a really smart and, and nuanced way. And what I found wonderful, Susan, is that you always kept putting the human story front and center of, of your historical analysis. And I, I think that was so important to watch all this these multiple stories unfold in a way that, that always kept the human voice front and center. So I, I thought I would kind of share a little bit about the, the stories that I found that were, were doing just that unfolding here. And the first is, as a historian, I saw this work really as a, a story about sources and, and how source, sources, um, in many instances, can be manipulated, um, both at the time they're being created and years later by historians who may not be critically evaluating how the sources were initially interpreted, um, whether it's by the, the letter receivers themselves or by popular culture, or um, as Joanna mentioned, by, by the military command and, and military leadership at the time. Um, and I, I think when you have this story in which Susan says there's so many contemporary actors that are wanting to, to preach a particular sermon. I, I really like that term. Um, whether it's war correspondents or magazine writers or even military leaders. Um, that, again, as a historian, this to me is, is very much a story about how popular narratives are constructed and maintained. And so, you know, to me, it's a, a wonderful book to to use in a graduate seminar to, to talk to students about how we as historians um, find sources and, and then interpret those sources um, in a way that's, I think, responsible and in a way that perhaps tells a different story that we might be comfortable with. Um, second, and, and not surprisingly, I, I think this is very much a story uh, about militarized masculinity and, and what we mean by that, that, that very, um, in a sense, paradoxical term in part because despite these popular depictions we have and, and assumptions that go with our understanding of military masculinity, I believe, it's that fragility is, is really what is undermining or um, is underscoring so much of our understanding of, of masculinity, we, um, which seems a bit paradoxical, but I, I think um, Susan does a wonderful job of laying out why these paradoxes might exist. That we assume in the popular narrative that the crucible of military service and, and especially the crucible of serving in combat is going to turn boys into men. Um, and I think what these letters show is um, there are some, some problems with those assumptions. And yet I, I wonder here if, if this myth in and of itself is even convoluted because as Susan suggests, the male bonds grew stronger from broken vows. And, and so one of the questions I had was how are these servicemen who were receiving these letters at once feeling vulnerable and fragile, but at the same time benefiting supposedly from these male bonds that are growing stronger because they are, are in receipt of these Dear John letters. Um, next, as, as Joanna mentioned, and, and I think not surprisingly, this is a story about double standards um, for wartime romance. Um, it's, again, I think linking to this theme of, uh, of male fragility, that the power of uh, supposed power of female infidelity, that it can threaten to undermine entire armies um, is, is pretty fascinating. And I think says something to, to male anxieties, um, even for those who are in uniform. Um, and here, I think the double standard is, um, is what I saw in my exploration of pop culture in the Cold War era as well, where male infidelity is expected um, and even seen as a reward for heroic service, um, especially in wartime. And yet we might ask then, why is it that unfaithfulness is deemed treacherous and even treasonous if you're a woman? Um, if you're a woman, 
and yet at the same time, uh, it's a masculinity affirming bonus if you are a man. And I'm reminded as I was reading this book, I, uh, I showed some clips in my War and Gender course of the, um, I believe it's 52 or 53, the film, uh, Gregory Peck film, The Man in the Gray Flannel Suit, which is again, at once a story of male anxieties about living in the immediate post-war um, era as, a, as an organization man in, um, in uh, U.S. suburbia and these fears that, um, that this feminizing suburban living is going to emasculate men. But at the same time, this is also um, a story of the lead character, um, Gregory Peck of all people, um, a, a story of wartime infidelity. And so, um, you know, to me, it's these paradoxes that, that come out of the letters, I think, that are really important for us to, to think about as we're studying topics related to war and gender. And when you go back to, I think, both the movie, The Man in the Gray Flannel Suit, and these letters, it, it, it's always incumbent on the woman, in the case of the, the film, it's incumbent on the wife to grant forgiveness and then ultimately to sustain this Cold War nuclear family with traditional, traditional gender norms. Um, set in place so the man is not emasculated by the experience and can continue to serve um, in, in proper ways during the Cold War era. Um, on another level, this is um, also a story about heterosexual coupledom and, and how that has been co-opted by um, the military for, um, for the purposes of, of military commands and leaders. And in, the, in that way, I think it reinforces the notion of, of sex in the military. And, and what I found fascinating here is that that story is not static, um, that we see these tensions between heterosexual coupledom and the development of male homosocial bonds um, evolve over time. And, and there are certain themes that I think are present throughout this story here, but you can also get a sense of um, some of these changing norms over time. Um, and yet in both cases, it seems that women are deemed both a threat and an outlet. Um, and so either way, um, the relationship to misogyny and, and as Susan, I think, points out, um, the potential for collective punishment is pretty clear. Um, and so I think it, it's really fascinating what Susan does here with these letters of showcasing how women might make soldiers, as she says, inefficient, um, because then they're worrying about the possibility of a broken relationship um, and, and the impact that will have on uh, military efficiency. Um, and as she notes, uh, senior leaders like Patton um, and so many others, and I've seen this in my own research, believe that, that, that fighting and effing uh, went hand in hand. And, um, and again, the paradox to me is interesting here because the onus almost always and in so many ways is placed on the woman to operate in a space that is acceptable. And it's the onus is to um, to operate in that space that is acceptable, not just to society, but as, as I think the letter showcase in Susan's analysis, that it's also acceptable for the military. Um, and so when you have opinion, opinion leaders and, and military leaders who are blaming um, both men and women for sex delinquency, it seems that the women are clearly um, bearing the brunt of the blame here. Um, in another vein, as, as Joanna mentioned, I think this is a story about um, the racial components of wartime romance. And, um, and I think we see these highlighted um, in these tensions, um, particularly when we do get to the um, Korean War and the American War in Vietnam, that, that Asian women in particular might be scheming predators, as Susan notes, um, but they're also in the popular narrative seen as inherently sexual and um, and uh, and what do we, how do we think about that um, with our contemporary understandings of the Oriental woman as it's related to, to male service? Um, here I'm reminded of um, Hannah Gatsby's, uh, the comedian Hannah Gatsby's uh, definition of misogyny um, in her stand-up, um, which really is a social commentary in Annette, which she argues that misogyny is uh, something that you at once detest and desire. And I think you see that um, played out in the, the racial components of these letters that, um, that these women are, are scheming predators, but also something to be absolutely desired. Um, and 
um, I think not surprisingly, neither the Asian women nor the Dear, Dear John letter writers seem to have much opportunities to speak for themselves here. Um, so again, this gets back to who is responsible for um, uh, creating popular narratives and, and even, I would argue, collective memories. Um, and then a few other stories I think are important here. I think um, this is also a story of the state um, inducing obligations. Um, what does that mean for women who are writing these letters, not for the sake of um, seduction, but for the sake of patriotism? Um, I do wonder, and this is a question I do have, of, of how much of this notion of fighting for the girl back home really matters to soldiers on the front line. Um, does it truly sustain them in combat or the immediate aftermath? Um, do, do letters truly have that much power? Um, Susan speaks of this expanding trellis of invented and exaggerated material. So I wonder how we can accurately evaluate the power of these Dear John letters as, as historians. Um, and then as a Vietnam historian, I, um, you know, I really think what Susan does with the American War in Vietnam is fascinating here because the, all of these narratives that I just laid out are further complicated when they're tied into stories about a lost war like the one in Vietnam, um, when, where treacherous women um, who stabbed uh, American soldiers in the back are partly to blame for, for Vietnam. Um, and, you know, we can think obviously of the most uh, popular femme fatale, Jane Fonda, who equally turns on men when she turns against the war. And I, I think all of this suggests this, this challenge of evaluating the source base um, that's tied so inherently to, to collective memory on the relationships between war and society back home. Um, and then the last thing I think, as I mentioned earlier, these relationships are not static with the coming of the all volunteer force. Um, as Susan notes by 1978, nearly 60% of soldiers were married and, and my own experience in the US Army um, suggests some of the issues with that. that um, I had officer evaluation reports um, where married officers who were in charge of units were evaluated as part of a command team with their wives. Um, and these wives were now co-opted into the military in an unofficial way um, to manage family support groups with little to no training. And there's been some wonderful work done by um, historians like Dave Kieran, who have argued that this became really problematic during the global war on terror with these high rates of PTSD in units, um, not just among soldiers, but also family. And then these women who are family support group leaders serving as substitute psychiatrists and, and emotional support leaders without fully understanding, I think, the larger context of the relationships between military and mental health and, and what's going on um, back home. Um, so to me, I, I think the, the biggest question is how do we evaluate the totality of a source base like this when it's, it's likely that many, if perhaps not most, soldiers didn't keep Dear John letters. And, and here I wonder if we can compare these letters to the Band of Brother thesis that became so popular with Stephen Ambrose's book in, in 1992. Um, in short, who would have written about their experiences of the military if they did not feel they were part of the Band of Brothers? Um, for those who weren't accepted into the group, what were their thoughts on camaraderie and wartime unit cohesion? And so, you know, are the sources, source bases um, skewed in a sense because um, um, those who don't want to tell a positive story are, are left out of that overall story. Um, so again, I, I think this is just a wonderful book, Susan. Again, congratulations. I, I found it so incredibly fascinating because all of these stories are piling up each on top of each other as you move through the book in such a wonderfully crafted way. Um, as Joanna said, I, I think there's just so much to, to unpack here for students and um, for folks that are for looking at the relationships between between the war and society. So thanks for um, for writing just a wonderful book. Thanks um, for those uh, comments, Greg. Um, did you want to also share um, uh, Professor uh, Buick's um, questions as well, just now, if you can? Uh, you're, on, you're on mute, Greg. Yes, I can. I actually sent her a text and, and said, I'm going to, uh, she, she sent me a letter to read and I told her I was going to start the letter with a, with a slight revision that said, I remember fondly the first time I wrote my first Dear John letter, um, but she said I should probably uh, stay away from that. So uh, here is the letter that Kara wrote. Um, Dear Susan, this is not a Dear John letter. 
but I thought that since I'm not actually present at your book launch celebration to talk with you and the other commentators and guests directly, that I would write you a letter. It seems only fitting. I sincerely apologize for not being able to be present in person. I was very much looking forward to what I am sure will be a wonderful conversation among scholars who I greatly respect. I'll start by noting that Dear John is one of the very best books I've read in years. I remember the first time that you told me about this project, right after The Good Occupation had been published. Every time we spoke of it, I thought that you really tapped into something, that you'd found that wonderful project that everyone else wished they had thought of themselves. I also wondered how you would manage to tackle such an ambitious and elusive topic. In less capable hands, this would have been a book simply about the letters, or even a book about wartime relationships that failed. And while that would have been an important study, Dear John tells a much more expansive, revelatory, and important history of gender and war from World War II through the recent wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Dear John, very simply, isn't about the Dear John letter. It's about the ways that wartime state mobilized love. It's a history of how the American military deemed stable heterosexual relationships essential for the war effort, for the morale of fighting men, for their post-war adjustment, and for victory. Love and marriage were not merely personal, private matters during wartime, but relationships that bore both immediate consequences for soldiers at the front and for the nation at large. Yet the marital and the martial had to perfectly align and that balance was never easy. Military officials both desired and distrusted stable relationships. Even as many military commanders wanted their men to have the steadying influence of good women, they also feared the power that women could wield. Women, they knew, could break men with only a few words. At its heart then, Dear John is about the power of women in wartime for both good and ill. Though it is also about the enormous pressures placed on them. Everyone from Dear Abby to Eleanor Roosevelt and General George Patton insisted that girlfriends and wives had a civic duty to boost the morale of soldiers at the front. They were what the men were fighting for after all, and they'd better be worth it. The consequences were simply too great. Jilted men drank to excess. They went AWOL. They committed atrocities and they attempted suicide, or so the story went. Despite the advances of military psychiatry and military efforts to shore up family support, women continued to bear responsibility for men's wartime mental health, even men halfway around the world, even men held for years in prisoner of war camps, even men who were not faithful themselves. We are fortunate to be participants in a continually growing community of scholars whose work examines the relationship among war, gender, and sex. Dear John makes important interventions into this field, even as it further complicates our understanding of how wars both affirm and disrupt conventional gender and sexual relations. I'm struck by the many contradictions that this study raises. On one hand, military officials prepared men to distrust women and to expect their unfaithfulness. On the other, national discourses rationalized war as a fight for home. Unfaithful women strengthened the homosocial bonds of war, even as a Dear John letter could demasculinize and victimize the band of brothers. And despite the ever-expanding presence of women in the US military, the Dear Jane letter has not become the equivalent of the Dear John. Military culture still expects women to keep, keep the home fires going, even if the women are no longer waiting at home. Home itself plays a nuanced and complicated role in this history. Although wartime separations challenge the stability and sanctity of the home, proximity also proved problematic. Technologies brought home closer to the front with reel-to-reel -reel tapes in the Vietnam War, emails in the Persian Gulf, and video calls in Afghanistan. But not all the news was good news, and the daily stresses of life at home proved distracting and worrisome at the front. It's a tenuous balance, too much or not enough. And it's one that military couples and families continue to manage today. Like all good books, Dear John points to new questions and possibilities. 
I'd love to know more, for example, about how evolving manpower policies and needs might have shaped Americans' understandings of the Dear John letter and of wartime marriages more broadly. Americans vociferously insisted on marriage deferments during World War II as a way to maintain the traditional family structure. As wartime demands necessitated that exemptions change, allowing for the conscription of some husbands, did public understandings of the function of the wartime family change as well? What might changing draft exemptions for married men tell us about wartime challenged Americans' experiences within marriage and understandings of, of its wartime functions? Did the ending of conscription in 1973 and the return to an all-volunteer force alter the cultural functions of wartime marriage and its demise? And I'd love to know more about how military couples in today's force understand and experience these issues. With one half of 1% of the American population serving in the military, does the Dear John letter or military marriage in general serve as an indication of a fractured relationship between military and civilian society as it did in previous eras? And what of peacetime military marriages? or of accompanied tours in which spouses and children go with a service member to his or her duty station? Do wartime and separation hold particular relevance and potential danger? Or does a military marriage force uh, face challenges that span wartime and peacetime? I would of course also love to know more about the women who wrote Dear John letters. We get a good glimpse of these women in the book of the pressures they felt to write well and often to put on a happy face for the duration. But I'd love to know more about their internal struggles to deal with wartime stresses, with the anxieties and opportunities brought on by wartime relocations and separations. And as you note in the very last line of the book, it's time to hear more voices. I would love to hear the voices of women who balance love for marriage with their own wartime and military work. Service women could marry during World War II, for example, but military officials separated the couple so that they could prioritize work over marriage. By the Vietnam War, many married nurses or army nurses lived with their spouses in hastily arranged billets to the chagrin of some commanding officials. How did these military marriages function as ideals or problems? And what are the gay couples who struggled with wartime separation on top of the pressures of having to remain closeted? War and love remain as entangled as ever, and perhaps there is something eternal in that relationship. Odysseus and Penelope appear throughout the pages, and I suspect that if you were writing the conclusion today, you might have ended with stories of families separated by war in Ukraine. We see the power and the challenge of wartime love in the heartbreaking photographs of husbands and wives clinging to each other for as long as they possibly can, of fathers waving goodbye to children they may never see again. Battlefield nuptials offer a more hopeful image, but one that is nonetheless laden with uncertainty. We know the stresses and challenges that they will face in the days to come. Perhaps now though, we'd better, we'd, we're better equipped to understand these relationships. In the very least, we can see that war, not women, is to blame for the destruction of wartime love. I'll keep this missive brief and hope for more conversations in the future. Congratulations on a wonderful book. Sincerely, Kara. Right. Thank you, Greg, for uh, sharing Professor Huick's uh, letter with us. And then, Kara, if you're watching this recording um, at, right now, thank you uh, as well. Um, so we'll move now um, to our final um, discussant, um, Dr. Aaron Hilfner. Um, Aaron, just take a look. Yeah, thanks very much. And thanks to you, Susan, uh, for producing such an amazing book. Um, I, I, when I was reading through this, I thought back to a quote from uh, Mary Lou Robertson's book, uh, What Soldiers Do, which is her look at U.S. soldiers invading France, particularly Normandy, and the chaos uh, that took place through that invasion. And one of the quotes that she has here is about how researchers dismiss at their own risk sexual relations as an ahistorical sideshow of combat. And I think the really exciting thing for this book and for the people on this panel and people in this room, I'm sure, is that I think we actually have done a pretty good job since that point of trying to avoid this pitfall and really thinking about how sexual relations, but also broader gender politics 
and how we can put that at the center of military experience and wartime. I think there's been a real flourishing in the field. So it's such an exciting time to read uh, this book. Uh, Susan's book is a new and vital entry into this field with so many invaluable insights for understanding some of the most intimate, the most painful and meaningful experiences that troops and civilians live through. Next to dying and birth, marriage and romance are some of the most important things in our lives. And I think those are all the more heightened by wartime. Uh, the book takes readers through what I can say is really exciting for a, a history book. It's a real emotional experience. Like reading this book, you really get involved into these people's stories and their lives. And it was great that I think you embrace that emotional journey uh, going through it. Um, the Dear John and Dear Jane, I think, make for fascinating insights into how inextricably uh, romance, sex, family, and love were to, to central, I think, to military concerns as well. So not just the military experiences of soldiers, but the day-to-day -day concerns of the most important decision makers within the military. When they were thinking about morale, when they were thinking about fighting strength, logistics, communication, the loyalty of people in society, they were thinking about sex and romance in part through this intermediary of the Dear John letters. And they were also considering how state power could be used to compel service among not just people in uniform, but people in society, as I think uh, the panel has pointed to. I think there's a lot more to say, but I just want to thank at the start, Susan, Beth Bailey, Andrew Preston, and Cambridge for putting together such an interesting book and a compelling study of gender and sexual relations in military history. Um, and while the focus today is obviously on celebrating um, Susan's book here, I also want to briefly remind everybody in the room and, and watching this later um, that there's a new edited volume coming out, Managing Sex in the U.S. Military from the University of Nebraska Press. Uh, Kara, who couldn't be here, is one of the co-editors, and I believe you're contributing a chapter as well. So look out for that uh, next month. Uh, one of the major points that I think Greg touched on a bit, so I'll, I'll try to keep this a little briefer, is the, the role of the state in, in mobilizing, regulating, and supporting male heterosexuality. Um, I think that's some of the most important things that we can take across here, across all these different wars, the branches and continents that Susan gets into, we can see how supporting male heterosexuality was essential to different military policies, technology, and understanding of morale and health of soldiers. Dear John Paul powerfully centers this across so many different conflicts, uh, from the sociologists and psychologists that are seeking to understand suicide, to the very designers of all the communication systems, the mail systems, right, the telephone systems, the internet, and how they're actually going to regulate that. These concerns about sex and romance are, are important to that. I think the book also shows how heterosexual men demanded the validation, companionship, and emotional outlet they found in women be supported by the policies and infrastructure of both the military and the state. Many uniform men clearly believe that the coercive power of the institutions ought to be used to induce women uh, to be endlessly loyal, prove their fidelity to both man and country as a kind of a simultaneous commitment, and to countenance whatever slight or humiliation or coercion that the military and state might put upon them. I think Dear John also examines how the military and broader society enforced a vision of male heterosexuality where women were expected, if not be standard issue as you, you, you delineate, but figures that must remain faithful and chaste even when men uh, we're not expected to. I think what you capture so well here about women is how they were subtly and very often not so subtly told that loyalty to their man would be essentially standard operating procedure uh, in wartime. Uh, this goes back to a fundamental point that I think Chris Capizola made in Uncle Sam Wants You, right? Namely that total war brings the state into the most intimate parts of the lives of civilians, right? And that's gonna be a key part in which the state mediates its relationship to civilians. Dear John also describes how much of men's attention, military resources, and social morality was used to police the behavior of women and to ensure that a quote unquote loyal woman would be if not a right of service, something that could be coercively volunteered in the same way that Chris talks about in his book. I think it also reveals that women did not passively accept these demands either. And I think it's something I'd like to hear more about I wonder to what degree some of these Dear Johns can actually be read, not just as a breakup of a relationship, 
but a protest against the societal demands the state was putting upon them. Maybe there aren't enough for us to actually know that, but I think it's worth exploring a bit more. Uh, Dear John also likely uh, succeeds in capturing how women often became the scapegoat for uh, military officials as Kara's um, letter just made, I think, really clear. The privations of war and the all too common cruelty that is baked into military service across several wars can be elided by the supposedly faithless woman who has sent her missive <laughs> explaining that it's all over and that there's somebody else now, right? We can put the blame on them. So I think it's a real credit that you can bring out that strand of history but it's also a real credit that while doing that and noting the many failures of heterosexual men in this time, I still think you're quite empathetic to the heartbreak and real emotional strife they must have experienced when feeling like their, their lives were falling apart upon receiving a letter like this. So it's an amazing balancing act that you do there. Dear John delves too into how the romantic familial and mental welfare of female troops was all too often discounted and views, viewed as something of an acceptable loss as part of the service. It's one of the most revealing discoveries of the book for me that the Dear Jane letter has arguably been a more common experience for troops and a more harrowing experience for women in uniform. It's one of those things that of course we should have seen before, but Susan I think does such a great job of bringing that out here. The US military, as you've pointed out, has continued and started to spend more resources on thinking about the relationships uh, for servicemen, but it seems by comparison that relatively little has been done uh, for women who are in uniform and what their relationships and families are like. So it's something that I think of an enduring legacy of a continuing to focus on heterosexual men that we need to be aware of as we continue to study um, this topic. I wanna to turn to something else too, and I think it's one of the most interesting elements is you tapping into this mythology uh, of the Dear John letter. Um, and Dear John does a, a good job of interpreting the stories and mythologies that grown out of the letters themselves. And here I think we can see how there's a, a really unique element of US military experience popping up in the form of characters, characters that populate the imaginations of servicemen and service women. They pop up as recurring modes of understanding what could be an overwhelming and bewildering experience of mobilization uh, and war. Within the barracks of World War II, for example, we probably know some classic characters uh, like the gold brick, the sad sack, the flat Peter, things that Paul Fussell talks about in, in his books. And these are all archetypical characters that groups of soldiers applied to others in their unit as a way of categorizing and ranking different members of an outfit. And as Susan also points out here, male civilian characters abound too. We have the four effort, Jody, standing in for the forms of resentment, fear, and hatred that troops often placed into men out of uniform. These characters in the minds of servicemen, certainly the uh, civilian characters that I just talked about, I mean, in the minds of the servicemen were doubtlessly you know, shirking duty. They're striking at their cushy job. They're slinking around to pick up the lovelorn girlfriends, right? So we can see how much mental power these characters have, even if they're not necessarily based in real fact. These characters reveal, I think, so much about the culture of the barracks, but they also help reveal a lot about these interior fears and desires of troops. And one of the great things about the book, I think, is how it captures how there are also crucial female characters populating the imaginations of troops. We have the treacherous wife, the anti-war girlfriend, the, stole, the girl who's stolen away uh, once the man is selflessly sacrificing himself for his country, right? So I think figuring out exactly how female characters play a large role in the creation of different cultures within the barracks is gonna be something that's really valuable to take from this book. Okay, I wanna turn now to be talking about um, how the Dear John, um, the analysis of the Dear John letter that you do here treats it as a genre. And this I think dovetails a bit with what Greg said, so I'll try to be briefer here. Um, but I really love how much you just don't take it as a face value document, but rather a genre created by the troops themselves. And I think this point is a crucial one, not for just understanding the source, but also understanding the cultures within the male dominated military. Many actions that men took when they were involving women were not for their just their experience with that woman. They were performed for other men in the unit. I think it's really telling that when Sam gets mad at Anne for showing him up, not showing up at the right place, even though it's, it's really Sam's fault. Um, 
that it's not just that he's mad at, at not seeing Anne. He's mad that he sh that she's shown him up in front of other men in his unit, right? Masculinity is for other men in, to a large degree often in the military. And I think as we discover throughout the book, some dear Johns are, you know, genuine ruptures and conclusions to relationships and marriages. Some letters exchanges are maybe more rare in this case, but amicable or expected. It's not necessarily a surprise. Others ambiguous, but many more, of course, are quite wrenching uh, for the person receiving it. But others, particularly those where the man, uh, man blithely explains that the partner just suddenly left, right? Capture mostly how men have thought about the specific demise of a relationship, but not what precipitated it. And a good deal of these Dear John messages, though, were also fabricated by servicemen. I think it's one of the most exciting points of what the book is doing, is showing that servicemen are fabricating some of these Dear Johns for their comrades' amusement, but also to engage in a kind of vicarious misogyny, a shared experience of hating women within the, uh, the group, especially I think during World War II and Vietnam. I think this is a really critical point because these rituals, the way that Joanna talked about them right at the beginning, reinforce a kind of belonging with the barracks. And I kind of want to pick up where, where, where some of what she said. More and more members of these jilted GI clubs in World War II, for example, or the Marines in Jarhead that you talk about, could feel a greater solidarity, right, in being um, cast away by the civilian world. It reinforces a lot of the training elements of what's going on in the military anyways, that you don't really want to be a part of the civilian world. They're different, they're soft, they're effeminate, right? And so in a way, something that might be emasculating, right, your woman leaving you for another man, is something that ends up being part of being reborn into an aggressive martial environment. You have to lose something to be reborn in this way, I think. And I think that's really important. It also shows how, um, uh, as Greg related to the, uh, in the stand-up routine, how this culture revels in sex and romance that the uh, uniform might entitle you to, but also reviles women at the same time in that confusing way. Um, this also uh, dovetails a bit with what Greg had said about what the, um, the interest of using this for our students. But I think it's something really worth highlighting, just what the teaching utility of this book might be. This obviously has so many applications for what we do in war and society or war and <coughs> gender modules. But I think it's even broader than that. I think when we're designing our research methodology modules, this is a book that should be a part of it, right? This is something that does such a compelling way of looking at written sources and thinking about the mythology that develops around them that I think that we can do something really interesting with it. Uh, as you talk about in the last line that others have highlighted too, right? There's more voices to bring out here. And one of the most interesting things that I think we can point students to is how silences are built into the creation history. Here I'm of course invoking the foundational text, silencing the past. And it's really important to understand how the marginalized are often excluded and destroyed in the production interpretation of record sources and archives. And I think we can see what you're doing here in Dear John is grappling with that problem. I really like how um, open you are in the introduction of just saying, I contacted, contacted these archivists. They were absolutely certain they might have a Dear John in there and it wasn't there. And I think that's so exciting that one of the most formative and memorable wartime experiences might not even be found in an ar archive centered on the military experience. So it's a really useful way for us to think about how silences are built into archival um, materials and how we try to recover them, right? And how we recognize when the silences are there. As I said before, Dear John pushes historians to avoid simply taking these letters and communications at face value, as uh, I think you point out, a lot of historians have too easily done that in the past, um, some even swallowing what are clear myths and fabrications. So I think in, in that sense, we have another model to give students how to interpret written materials and how to understand the creation of myths, genres that shape our perceptions of war, uh, loyalty of civilians, why wars were fought for, won and lost. Um, as we've talked about at the beginning, the through line through this book, which is so exciting, is um, Anne and Sam's relationship. And of course, the dear John initially introduced in the beginning is something much more different when we get to the end. So the last major point that I wanted to talk about here is kind of wondering about how many corollary and related forms exist in other cultures of war. Uh, 
Um, one of the things I just wondered is how other people in other cultures have dealt with love, loss, and separation during wartime, especially during this period. What kind of corollary and similar Dear John, Dear Jane forms exist? And how do those genres manage the negotiation of loyalty and faithfulness in wartime, especially among different genders? I was mainly drawn to Landes, uh, L-A-N-D-A-Y-S, if you want to look it up. This is the poetic form used by Afghan women. It's a source I've used for a long time in teaching, uh, especially among women in, 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 in Pashtunistan. So the, these, these poems are very interesting. They're couplets. And basically, they've emerged as a very important form of writing during wartime, ever since the Soviet era, but it have even more accelerated uh, since 2001. And interestingly, this form of poetry, which has overwhelmingly become associated with war for women in Afghanistan, the audience is other women, often in private, but increasingly with the penetration of the internet on Facebook. You can find many forums where women in Afghanistan share these kind of couplets. The poems use wartime as their setting with an intense and often acerbic wit and a remarkable humor that I think surprises students when they look at them. Um, they look mainly at the relationship between sex, violence, loyalty, and betrayal, and the relationship to the men who are fighting. So I wonder again, how much more is there that we can find on this? There's a great collection of these online if you're interested at the Poetry Foundation that was collected by uh, Eliza Griswold. So I, I think, let me shift now to my questions and, and it'll build off what I just said here. Is there something unique about the US form of Dear Johns and Janes? And can similar forms in other cultures to the degree that we, we know about them, tell us something that is unique about the, Utah, uh, the US wartime experience of romance, combat, and all these things? I also wondered to the degree to which there were differences um, in the experience of a uh, Dear John or how it was received or how it was understood amongst the different ranks of, 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 of troops. So did the non-cons and enlisted have a different experience of it? Did officers have a different experience of it? I'd like to know whether that hierarchy and some of the class built into that impacted things. I think Kara pointed this a bit already, but you know, did being dear John in wartime differ than peacetime? If you're serving in South Korea, but not necessarily on a front line in wartime, does that change things as well? Uh, Joanna talked about this too, but perhaps we'll talk more about it. To what degree do you actually believe the psychological theories offered up by the military, particularly in chapter six is when you go into that. Um, I, I think the, the other thing too to consider, and, and maybe this is the last two things, what impacted the military's goal of separating the civilian world from the military world in a lot of its training, having driving the divisions and breakups among capitals and families? And does the all volunteer force change this in some significant way or not? And lastly, I would say, to what degree can we think of the Dear John letter as a kind of conscious protest by one of the early comments that I had? Um, other than that, I just want to say thank you. It's been such an enjoyable, interesting book. It made me think of so many different things that I would change about how I teach about World War II and gender and, and wartime. So thanks so much for sharing this with us. All right. Um, thanks for that, uh, Aaron. Um, so now we've heard from all our discussants. I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Professor uh, Carruthers to, to respond. Um, so Susan, please go ahead. Okay, well, I am thinking I need to write another book very fast <laughs> so I can have another event at which I sit and drink wine for an hour or more and listen to people say incredibly flattering things about what I've just written. I, I haven't had a book launch before, so firstly, I, I need to say a huge thank you to, to Mark. You have spent a lot of time cutting through bureaucratic red tape and trying to figure out how to spend Cambridge University Press's money under the aegis of King's College London. And this, I know, has not been easy. And I would like to say a huge thank you to Joe, Greg, and Aaron for providing such not only laudatory and <laughs> deeply humbling comments on my book, but also for engaging so thoughtfully with, with what I've done. It's a, a real honor and thrilled to be sitting here absorbing um, all of this sort of positive energy and your very thoughtful responses. So I'm going to keep my comments brief in the interests of allowing both the audience sitting here 
and anyone who's listening online to, to, to offer their own responses, both to the panelists as, as well as to, to me. Um, I didn't prepare any remarks in advance. This is another great thing about being the, the, the recipient of, of comments on a, a book launch panel. I wrote the book. I didn't have to sit down and come up with remarks in advance. But I'll, I'll say a few things. I obviously can't do justice to all of the many, many questions that the four of you, including Kara, have, have posed to me. But I guess what's worth stressing for the benefit of those of you who are here or, or listening, watching online later, and who haven't read the book, which I'm guessing is probably pretty much everyone who didn't just offer comments. Um, so the, the first thing to, to underscore, which you've probably uh, sensed by now, is that I chose to write a book about this phenomenon, the Dear John Letter, breakup note written by a woman to a man in uniform in the near total absence of there being extant Dear John letters that have been um, bequeathed to archives and that people like me can, can go and, and dig up. I expected when I started researching this topic that I would find at least some. And as various of the panelists have, have hinted, I found essentially none with only a handful of exceptions, which I could probably count on the fingers of, of one hand. So the iconic Dear John that has been mentioned by, by several of you is, is a V-mail that was written by a young woman in Newark, New Jersey, which for more than a decade was my adoptive hometown. So it's worth also stressing that I lived and worked in the United States for 15 years. Um, and it was during those 15 years that I became intrigued by Dear John Letters and started work on this topic. So I was particularly drawn to this one of uh, a tiny number of, of letters that we know without a shadow of a, uh, without a, shadow of a doubt, sorry, that a, a woman actually wrote. And we can know with total confidence the form of words that she'd used. She told her boyfriend, who she had never met, it's also worth stressing. This was one of those um, iconic World War II relationships in which a young woman rather daringly started to write to a young man who was a friend of a friend um, who she had never actually met and didn't meet for many years. And at a certain point, about 18 months into their epistolary courtship, she wrote him this furious one-liner telling him to go to hell. And he was so piqued by getting this that he promptly sent it to Yank, which was the Army's weekly magazine. He was stationed somewhere in England at the time. And Yank's London-based edition um, printed it. And they printed it in facsimile form. So you can see it's the first or maybe second illustration in the book, um, a copy of this. It appeared later the same month that Anne had sent it. And because of the mail, which was a sort of a new innovation of World War II, sort of patriotic stationery, which was microfilmed and sent overseas on, on, on reels of film and then printed off and reproduced at the other end. Um, microfilm, a bit like an aerogram, had a space in the top right hand corner in which the sender of the email um, placed her own name and mailing address. And because Yank printed this, as it had been sent to its recipient, Sam Kramer, Anne's address was entirely legible. So Anne received well over 100 pieces of mail from random servicemen, um, anyone really who had encountered her email to Sam. So she intended to, to of course, be an entirely private communication. Um, it became thoroughly public. And she kept all of the mail she received, which was well over 100 letters and other emails from people in the States, people in Britain, people all over the place who had all sorts of things to say to her about this. And I encountered this in the course of um, a collection of women's World War II correspondence that was later um, bequeathed to Chapman University. And this was billed as, as the only sort of authentic Dear John letter that the compilers of that collection had received. And other historians had written about it, including the two historians who put that together. And they suggested that Anne received a lot of emails, emails, a Freudian, so <laughs> emails and letters rebuking her for having done this most treacherous thing in wartime, namely 
dumping a man serving away from home off in the European theater of operations. The, the correspondence Anne received is actually at Cornell University in the Special Collections, and it was the very first research trip I made, I think, in the summer of 2016, shortly before I moved back to the UK myself. And what I found was really eye-opening, because only some of the letters were actually rebuking Anne for doing this most treacherous thing. I would say far more of the correspondence she got from complete strangers was of a type that went something like this. Hey, Anne, you're obviously a feisty gal, <laughs> and evidently you're single. So how about when this will finally ends, you keep a spot on your dance card for me? Um, because, you know, I'm looking for dates, so maybe you'd like to write to me. Oh, and could you send me your photo? Quite a lot of them, as I point out, uh, I responded to this in part because it was a Newark, New Jersey story, and I lived there for a long time. They invoked shared Jersey origins, Newark was some of their hometowns. And one of the things that was so intriguing to me about this correspondence was that here were all of these young men who appreciated that letter writing in wartime was surrounded by this dense thicket of rules. They understood that there were rules, but they didn't know exactly what the rules were. They knew that Anne had obviously broken them, but that didn't deter many of them from wanting to enlist Anne as a correspondent and pen pal of their own. But I, I was immediately plunged into this sort of world of letter writing, of relationship formation, in which a constant negotiation was going on between observing rules, trying to figure out what they were, and breaking them or circumventing them, sort of testing the elastic limits of the rulemaking that was so densely going on in, in wartime. So I, I thread this story through many chapters of the book. Um, I use it in part to elucidate the theme of rules of engagement, how over successive decades, the military, the wartime state, as several of you have pointed out, um, tried to discipline women and discipline effective life on the home front. Um, but also all sorts of other people took up that work. And to me, that's perhaps one of the most unexpected things I encountered in researching the book is that it wasn't just the wartime state that wanted women to both write letters to men in uniform, enter into emotional, um, emotional relationships with them and sustain them through the power of fidelity and loyalty. All sorts of other people, civilians were doing that as well. And a lot of women, especially characters who we in Britain would call agony aunts, in other words, magazine advice columnists, were I think some of the most strenuous, strenuous, uh, vociferous um, and energetic disciplinarians of home front emotion. So I can't respond to all of the questions. Um, I'll, I'll just pick up a few of them that I sort of have perhaps remember the most from, from my attempts to take notes and drink wine um, over the course of, of the last hour. So perhaps I, I will preface, preface this by, by saying that for those of you who picked up on, you know, one of the things that you might do with the book in, in teaching settings is to think about the use of evidence. What do you do when the thing you want to write about doesn't exist in the form of, of of dozens, hundreds of Dear John letters. And what I found was that that absence actually was incredibly telling because where Dear Johns do exist and where they perhaps exist most profusely is in the male oral story tradition that surrounds them. So what I ended up doing was writing a book that's about letters, but also about stories and about storytelling. And it's really, as I see it, about the interplay between letters, letters written by women, but also the dear John genre, as I see it, more properly, we might say, has been authored by men. And it's been authored by men in the sorts of stories that they share primarily with other men about being dumped, about being, being abandoned, being betrayed. And, and, and so several of you picked up on, on the way in which 
um, female treachery turns out to be an incredibly valuable emotional resource for male bonding, for male solidarity. It gives the recipient of a breakup note immediate um, sort of credentials to enter this particular um, cadre of rejected men who can bond perhaps in an especially intensified form over the fact and fate of being jettisoned and dumped by women and, and the, sort of, <clears throat> the, the sort of particular singular awfulness that is imputed to the women who presume to do that. So to me, that was one of the biggest challenges of the book, but it also provided me with perhaps the biggest epiphany of what I was doing was that we need to approach this singular letter around which so much swirls through the prism of male storytelling and male bonding. So I agree with you that um, my own heartfelt final line about it's time to hear other voices, um, I, I would love to be able to, to actually access more of those voices. In other words, the voices of women who sent Dear John letters on the one hand, what were they thinking? I know a bit about what Anne Goodis, the New Yorker who sent the Go to Help email was thinking, but Sam didn't keep her letter. So we have the female only because he sent it to Yank and Yank publicized it um, and it generated all of that attention. Um, women's voices appear in much more fragmentary ways. Um, so in World War II, various women tried valiantly to, to raise their voices to, to gain um, space in the very limited bandwidth that was available to women who'd been jilted by servicemen. So as, as many of the panelists pointed out, this is indeed a story about, about gender double standards, about the latitude that's extended to men to dump women and or to sleep with other women while serving in uniform and, and get away with it. That behavior is not only condoned, but often um, lauded. Uh, whereas it was another story for women and, and women tried. They told journalists about this. Uh, they too wrote letters to Yank, to Stars and Stripes, saying, well, wait a minute, what about uh, the men who dumped us? What about our, nobody had coined the phrase Dear Jane letters. But they also pointed to another phenomenon that nowadays we refer to as ghosting. The fact that more often than not, the men in uniform who betrayed women, whether civilian women or women in uniform, simply disappeared speechlessly, silently. And to me, that seemed a particularly cruel way, perhaps, of ending relationship. Um, but I was struck that some of these agony aunts, women and vice girls, told women basically suck it up, you know, or told men it's, it was an acceptable way for them to end a relationship, because sooner or later, she would get the message. But of course, as anyone who has been tried to decipher silence, uh, what it might mean when a friendship or a relationship ends without any verbalization of what might have given rise to that rupture, nothing is more indecipherable, more open to multiple interpretations than silence. And of course, women who are anxious and wondering about what had happened to their loved one in uniform who was serving in a frontline theater overseas, I think might well have been forgiven for thinking that this was a particularly cowardly way to end a relationship because of course the woman was going to worry that it didn't just mean that things were over, it might have meant something much more lethal um, had happened to the man and not just to the relationship. So I, I would love to figure out ways in which we can hear more about women's experiences and perhaps as, as I forget who it was, um, perhaps it was Cara's letter that suggested um, that oral history with women um, and particularly women in uniform. I mean, th th this is one of the most obviously silenced groups that my work deals with, is the fact that in all of the dominant wartime narratives about emotional relationships, about the importance of intimacy, the necessity to sustain it for the duration, the presumed sort of default setting for who the, the, the partners in these heavily freighted wartime relationships are is that it's a man in uniform and a woman. And the presumption is that it's a, a female civilian. And of course, this totally ignores the fact that, that large numbers of women, about 400,000 women served in uniform in the United States in World War II, 
and growing numbers of, of women have, have joined, served in the armed forces um, over successive decades in the 20th and 21st centuries. And it seems to me that their voices and their experiences are, are perhaps more thoroughly absent from the record than any other. And, and if I were to follow up um, my own work with more work on this theme, I'm not doing this right now, but if I were to, or if I were encouraging um, students or others to take up this sort of um, baton, I would say that those would be the voices to, to try to find, and perhaps particularly um, with women who served more recently, with whom oral histories can still be undertaken, that I think would be a particularly rich avenue to explore. As it is, I mean, perhaps the single most important source of material for my book was the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress in Washington, DC. And I spent literally hundreds of hours listening to recorded oral histories with veterans of wars from World War II onwards. Um, the vast majority of them were with male veterans. Um, and only one or two, well, not one or two, more than one or two, but a, 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 a very tiny proportion of the total that I listened to were with, with women. So I would hope as we move forward and as archives become more self-conscious perhaps about the gendered imbalances in their collecting policies, that female veterans as well as women's civilian wartime experiences will garner more attention. Um, I can't, as I kept saying, do justice to all of these comments. Um, I think, Joe, your point was well made that in my chapter that deals particularly with how psy professionals, psychiatrists, psychologists, um, and others have, have sort of tried to psychologize the dynamics of wartime relationships and pathologize often the waiting wife and especially the military wife who didn't wait. I do do too much lumping together. Um, and in self-defense, I would simply say that that was one part of one, one chapter, but, but you're absolutely right that there's far more that one could say about uh, military medical professionals, um, how the this, this sort of psychiatric and, and, and psychological professions have been militarized and how that's evolved over time. It's a much more complicated story. There's also much more that could be said about the chaplaincy, that branch of the, the, the military that occupies very particular and rather nebulous space, part social worker, part the emotional caretaker, as well as spiritual counselor that does so much work in shaping um, emotional life in wartime for men and women, women in uniform, providing counseling in extremis, but also doing a, a lot of work, touched only briefly about the racialized contours of my topic. Um, and the, the military, um, the military chaplaincy, I think it played a tremendously important role in, in World War II and Vietnam in, in trying to channel men in racially appropriate marriages and relationships. And that's something that I would love to spend more time researching. I think I've probably said enough, perhaps even more than enough, and I'm going to cease and desist right there and invite uh, those in the audience, both here in this room, thank you for coming and sticking with us, and anyone who's um, in the Zoom call or whatever technology we're using to, to ask their own questions. All right, thank you very much, Susan.